good morning. We'll go ahead and call this meeting to order. Please stand and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome. Thanks, everyone, for coming. It is May 23rd. This is Broadwater County Commissioner's General Business Meeting. Uh, before we get started, just some very light housekeeping. We realize we have a fiscal and fiduciary responsibility to conduct our meetings in a way that is civil and makes them open to all Broadwater County citizens. Our meetings are recorded and are on YouTube, so prior to any public comment, please state your name for the record. Uh, any citizen who wishes to speak will have an initial three minutes to do so. Outbursts will not be tolerated, and um, all comments should be directed to the presiding officer. So with that, we will go ahead and start with public comment. Is there any public comment this morning? Joan. Joan Hill, I was wondering why we still have the horses taken care of. Thanks, Joan. That's a legal issue. Uh, we cannot get rid of all of them, I understand, until the legal trial is done and it's still pending. So it's the wheels of justice turn slow, and I understand that they're evidence. Um, Nick, do you have anything to add to that, having been? Yeah, they're, uh, they're still considered evidence, so the, the county uh, still has a responsibility to keep that evidence. Um, one case has, has been cleared and taken care of, but there's still an ongoing case on, on, I think, two or three of those horses. So those are still evidence. And until that case is done, uh, the county still has to keep uh, preserve that evidence. So I believe sometime in August it's set, uh, hopefully be done in August, but uh, that's subject to change. Is that the trial? Uh, yes, yeah, the initial, in, initial uh, well, it might be June. I thought, I thought that. that. We have somebody said June, and isn't it down to five horses now? Yeah, yeah. They, well, and they gave, uh, they were able to adopt several of them out, and they're in Great Falls now. So they, the ones that they have been able to get rid of, they have. The evidence is still being preserved. Thanks, Nick. Mm -hmm. Any other public comment? Dwayne. Dwayne Hall. Uh, what all is the case for getting on the agenda? Uh, what are we, what, what's the situation there? Anyone can get on the agenda. You can speak during public comment. You can speak on any issue once we get into the agenda. Uh, we do have a policy. If you want to give a presentation, just let us know what it is. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Do we, do we have to submit questions or what, what do we have to do? Nope, not unless you want full answers. The reason we asked Bill to submit questions as he already had. We just wanted to make sure we had them all so that we could have all questions answered. And we worked with Bill on that. So that was one of the partnerships that we're very proud of in this county. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Thanks for asking. Any other questions? Any other public comment? All right. We'll move on to Montana Minute. This is an opportunity to say something good about our community or our state. Franklin, I'll start at the end of the table again. You're on a good rain. That's the most important thing is right now. All right, Nick. Um, graduation was Sunday. It was good to see uh, class graduate and move forward to what they're going to accomplish. It's an exciting time. Um, kind of the opposite of the kids looking forward. Um, I want to salute the museum. Uh, they had their annual meeting on Sunday, last Sunday. Um, but uh, Barb Kersher uh, made some comments that I thought were really wise about two years ago in a commission meeting. And she said, if you don't know where you have been, it's hard to know where you're going. And if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. Um, so uh, that's my Montana minute, I guess. It's both the museum, our history, our heritage, and Barb Kersher. Anybody else have a Montana Minute they want to share? All right. Uh, Commissioner's Community Update. Franklin, what'd you do this week? Let's see what I had written down here. Uh, 
hospital boards meeting, went to that. Northwest Energy on the Hepkin Dam failure, I went on uh, one day on that Thursday, I guess, or Wednesday, whatever day it was. And then uh, Volunteer Appreciation Day, uh, attended that here. I pretty much did the same thing Franklin did. Uh, it was really good to have that uh, Broward County Volunteer Appreciation. Uh, we had some good speakers from the governor's office. And, and not only that, just uh, it's amazing to see what the volunteers of Broward County uh, does and gets accomplished. So hats off to our volunteers. I attended the same three. Um, MC for the uh, day of recognition, I thought, hit it out of the park. Um, I also attended a tax lien uh, working group. Um, the legislature tasked Mako with coming up with some language for uh, fixing some legislation. And so we've been working the past year, county commissioners, county attorneys, county treasurers, and county clerk and recorders. And I think we're ready. So we'll be meeting with them in about two weeks. Um, that's it. So we will move on to um, more housekeeping, and that is taking care of our minutes. We have minutes here from May 16, 2016. Those were sent out, I believe, on Tuesday. As soon as we approve the minutes, we'll go ahead and reopen public comment. Oh. How's that? Sounds good. I'd make a motion to go ahead and approve the commissioner meeting minutes uh, dated May 16th. No second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of May 16, 2016. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries. Thanks, Anne. All right, public comment. Look, Sarah. I just one quick thing is uh, Deputy Coroner Andy Martin uh, stepped down from his coroner duties this weekend. He's uh, going to take on some new adventures and, and felt that he wasn't doing justice. So um, Seth Wenzel has, has opted to fulfill those duties. So I'm going to appoint him as a deputy coroner uh, and he'll attend the coroner basic in December. Um, we'll do a little OJT and FTO on the on the corner stuff, but uh, with the, the busyness of it, I can't. I, I, I need that extra extra body. So I just want to let you guys know uh, there was a resignation in the, in the on the corner side of the house. Uh, and he's still going to uh, stay on as a as a part time officer when he can get back. But uh, since there's a stipend included in that, he didn't feel that it was justified for him to accept that and, and not be here for those things. So. Um, just want to give you guys a heads up, keep you in the loop of that. So, any questions, concerns? No? Okay, that's all I have for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Wynn. All right, we have a few minutes then to do some mail. Um, first piece of mail is a request to be on the agenda for next week, and this is from our detention center administrator. Um, and uh, basically he's looking at the amount of money he's spending in overtime and thinks that that can be better spent in a part-time uh, control officer. <clears throat> so we'll be able to talk at that, talk with him at that, on that at length uh, next week. So we'll go ahead and add that to the agenda. So next we have a letter from uh, Denise Thompson at the Broadwater Conservation District this is something that Debbie Kelly has been working on um, with accounting. Uh, Denise would like to add some permissive mill levies to the conservation district to help pay for um, increases in costs to group health benefits. Debbie's contention is that permissive mill levies are a, um, a process that goes through Department of Revenue. They actually have a formula that is filled out by the Conservation District. Um, so this is not necessarily something that would come from the county. 
So I think uh, you know we can certainly write a letter, um, let them know the process, and send that back. Um, we set the mills, but we don't determine how much they are. just got that too, so that's why you didn't have a copy before the meeting. We have a letter from the Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks, and this is <clears throat> talking about their work plan, uh, proposed agreements, and we had that update uh, when we had our partners meeting here a couple weeks ago. We have a bill from Verizon and it just shows who's paying what on those different bills. We have a claim, let's, I should put this under signature stuff, so I'll come back to that. This is an EA that was given to us uh, to review. We can see it online or we have a hard copy here Hard copy will be in the commission office if anybody wants to see it. Um, this is a finding of no significant impact to decision notice as completed for the Willow Creek Dam and Reservoir Transfer Final Environmental Assessment EA. The final EA and finding of no significant impact decision notice can be viewed at their website and here's a hard copy. On every year, uh, his memo says every year we get written up on our by our auditors for having too much money in our bank account and STIP, which is the short-term investment pool that's uh, provided to all counties by the Board of Investments. It's actually our money, but we're authorized to use it in a way that they determine. So uh, we have too much money in that account on the last day of the fiscal year. I asked the bank to increase our pledged securities which will allow us to keep a higher balance of our accounts at the end of the fiscal year. This will make it possible to keep the money in STIP where it is readily available <coughs> instead of buying a bond or other type of investment and having to cash in another investment a month or two later and getting penalized for cashing in early. I asked the state bank for this back in June of 2015 and have it done today. I met with you back in June or July of 2015 about this and just wanted to let you know it is completed. And there's one for each of you. Thank you. Thank you. And we have a uh, PILT request kind of. Um, at the end of last year, we decided to pay the heat and electric for the ambulance building out of the commissioner's budget. We changed that um, per an accounting request uh, back in maybe January-ish. Um, so what we have here is a heat and electric bill for the month of April of $433.51, and we need to have a vote in order to pay that out of the bill. These are for the utilities over there? Yes. Okay. I make a 
motion to go ahead and pay the Northwestern Energy bill for the extension. Out of pill. Yeah, sorry, out of pill. Sorry. I'll shut it yeah, it's been moved and seconded to pay the $433 for the uh, ambulance building utilities from PILT. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries. And to clarify, it's 433.51. $160,793.35. And make a motion to go ahead and pay payroll in the ex, um, amount of $160,793.35. One second. It's been moved and seconded to pay payroll in the amount of $160,793.35. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries. And we have claims in the amount of, these are the approved claims from last week in the amount of $28,256.86. And I will also make a, a motion to go ahead and pay the approved claims of $28,256.86. No, sure. It's been moved and seconded to pay the approved claims in the amount of $28,256.86. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries. that we started, um, we'll go ahead and read off what the, the claims are for. If you want some detail on that, we have those here as well. Please just ask. So we have office solutions for $83.10. A to Z staffing solutions for $13.24.30. Burt's Industrial Hardware for $8.89. Bison Ford for $313.61. Camera Cabling, $48.75. Bob Barker Company, twelve sixty nine point three one. Bob Supermarket, nineteen dollars and seventy four cents, seventy two dollars and sixty six cents. Broadwater Ford, seven eighty one point seven five. Broadwater Reporter, two hundred and four dollars. Reimbursement to an employee, two hundred and fifty seven dollars and forty cents. Capital Sports and Western, nineteen thirty four point two seven. And 18, oh, excuse me, CenturyLink, 242.66. City of Townsend, 685.80, 64.80. Connect Telephone and Computer, $350. Copy Cup, $165. DIS Technologies, 20, and Copy Cup was for copies, not for copy. DIS Technologies, $24.75. Global Star, 47.98. Reimbursement to an employee, 22.41. Um, medical for, uh, that's protected by HIPAA, 209. Uh, reimbursement to a uh, board member, 94.97 for expenses. Industrial towel, 42.85. Intoximeters, 221. John Deere Financial, $44.91. KC Tire and Glass, 678.76. Reimbursement to an employee, 42.17. Mako for Inmate Medical, 245.70. Merck, um, Merck Sharp and Dom Company, Corporation, 1763.37. Midwest Lab Laboratories, $100. Montana Internet Corp, $60. Reimbursement to an employee, $400.
Montana Broom and Brush Supply, 890.64. Part Source, 153.96. Redstone Leasing, $100. Response Systems, $81.56. Reimbursement, $49.12. Santa, uh, Santa Fi, $702.95. Stericycle Inc., $24.33. Timekeeping Systems, $438.74. Townsend Drug, $413.77. Tri County Disposal. 11,155.40. Reimbursement, $20. Any questions? All right. Billy. On the Tri County? Mm -hmm. Is that like a monthly fee? Or mm -hmm. is that? Yep. All right. Do we have a COS review? I don't see any here. Nick, did you want to discuss this now? Would this be a good time, do you think? Oh, yeah. Okay. So in light of uh, the, the towns and uh, the city of towns and going through the lagoon water waste uh, project, um, I just uh, I thought it would be good, uh, along with um, to show the the support for the for towns and to go ahead with their project, knowing that it has to be done. I just thought it would be something uh, that we could show our support and build those bridges back up with the, the, um, the city again, um, help them out in, where, in which ways we can and things of that nature. Um, I think it'd be a good project to start mending some bridges. Nick attended the city uh, public hearing about, well, it was in April, um, and that's where this came from. This isn't pledging money at this point, correct me if I'm wrong. No. It's pledging support for a Treasure State Endowment grant through the Department of Commerce. Yeah, they've got to do it anyway. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I just, if they know that we are behind them, I think yeah. it's a, a good way to boost that morale. Yeah, good idea. So we should have a vote to go ahead and sign this letter. I move. We send this letter to the, is the Department of Commerce you sent it to? They had it on there? Yes. Okay. In okay. regards to the, uh, the city town to put in for their wastewater My project. Was, I'd second that. Yeah, it's been moved and seconded to sign the letter to Treasure State Endowment Program. On behalf of the City of Townsend and the TSEP request for the Lagoon Wastewater Project. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries. time to start it during election. <laughs> yeah. No. Not their election that's, though. That's true. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see, we are we don't have well we might have Mr. Shepherd here. I don't see anything we can move forward on the agenda this morning, but we only have five minutes. Um, you know what, we could go ahead and start just five minutes early with our next agenda item, Bill Amps, County Bid Process and Project Review. Come on up, Billy. Is Corey coming in for this? I, I don't know. Would you like him to? I thought he was. But... All right. Thanks, Ann. Good morning. Thanks. Good morning.
Yes, if he needs us to wait, we can certainly do that. Too. I don't know if he, you know, he talked about it before. How much rain did you get out there? Inch and, inch and three tenths. There was about a half inch. Or over half inch uh, two days before. Oh, yeah. That was Saturday when I came into town. Saturday morning. There's a lot of standing water on, on the roads. All right. Uh, we are here at your request. And what we have in order to start um, a couple of handouts. The first one is we received a letter from you yeah. um, stating that these were the questions that you wanted us to answer. And then we also, in fact, I can give those to you. We also have an email from uh, Corey Swanson, the county attorney, and um, this was before getting these questions. But what he said is, I believe Mr. Amps has made it clear in his public comments that he wants to discuss the roof repair project at the museum building. He has also mentioned a building project for solid waste. He has indicated to me that his main question is whether those two repair construction pro projects were done legally, on whose dime and who approved. So we'll answer those as well, even though those aren't some of the questions that you gave us. All right. So we also have a have just kind of a checklist so that you can keep us on track so that we cover everything. I know the museum thing is a real complicated situation. So. Yeah. Yeah, although our side of it isn't. So we can we can still talk about that and make sure that you have all the answers that you need. And there's just some checklists for you guys, too. Um, Basically, what I'm hoping for, Billy, and I just want to make sure that we're on the same page before we get started, is number one, to answer all your questions that you have in full. Yeah. Make sure that we leave this meeting today without any further questions, everybody being of a common understanding and you having a, some facts. Um, and then also maybe setting a goal, it's my hope, that we can actually also leave this meeting being partners with the community. Um, working together to maybe all be a part of the solution. I've already seen some good stuff that's coming out. So. Good, good. All right, so here's a copy of the letter uh, that we had a discussion about last last meeting okay. um, and the meeting before that. I just wanted to make sure that we put that on record again, that we're meeting today instead of last week by mutual agreement. And um, I personally really appreciate you coming in to talk to me about that this past week. So thank you for that. All right, any questions so far on our goals for today, the checklist? No, I, I, I would just like to say, um, I think this is the way that going forward that business should be handled, uh, setting up meetings and handling it the proper way. Um, keeps us on track and it also takes out um, personal agenda items and allows us to do county business. And I think that's, uh, talking with several people, uh, we just need to get back on track of handling county business instead of um, these rabbit trails and bypassing county business. Um, so I do appreciate you going through this process with us. Not that the road hasn't been bumpy, at least, at least we're here now and trying to get something accomplished. So uh, I do appreciate that. All right, so um, what we have to start, this is Title Seven, Part 5, or excuse me, Chapter 5, Part 23, and it's the entire MCA for you. We, this is what we follow. I put together just a bid process. Okay. Um, 
and I, I heard back from Nick that that was it. Because it hasn't been approved by the commission, um, I didn't bring it forward. Okay. And because it is just reiterating this, it really isn't necessary. So um, basically what we do, again, according to MCA, is we follow one of two different bid processes. The first one is formal and competitive. Anything over 75000 we put out to bid. We follow a three-work week advertising process in the, re the reporter. Um, bids come in, they're sealed. They are opened in a agenda commission meeting all at once. All names and amounts are on the public record. We give that stack to the department head, whoever it is, um, and they go back, they follow up, they um, check for completeness, they come back to us then also on the agenda and say these are the, um, this is who I recommend and why. And then we proceed from there. By law, we have to take the lowest responsible bidder. We cannot guarantee that it's a local. It could very well be somebody from Billings um, who's going to be here vacationing in any way and they can, you know, make it a very inexpensive project for them. If that's the lowest, responsible bidder, we have to take it. We have a little bit of wiggle room, which you'll see in there, yeah. but it's very, very small. And, and some of that helps also, uh, just for everyone to know, is that key word responsible in there. It's not saying we're going to go with the lowest bid, it's the lowest responsible bid, making sure that all of our criteria is being met, and not just saying, okay, well, they came $15,000 on a bid, they're going to get it, but then in the long run, we're paying that 15,000 plus because certain things weren't met. So the key word to, to hit on there is responsible. So I think that helps in a lot of areas uh, with that word being in there. And the second option that MCA gives us is more of an informal bid proposal process. Same things, it starts the same way. A department head comes to us and says, I have a need. They justify the need, they tell us and show us their budget, do they have the means to pay for it? Um, and then we send them off to go ahead and get it done. They work with our building supervisor, if necessary, depending on what their need is. Um, we ask that they get three bids, that's not always a possibility. The inline grinder is a great example, there just were no bids that came in. Um, they do try and go local, and uh, we'll talk about an opportunity for them to try and, and keep things local, but. If we don't have a list of who the locals are, or we don't get responses from locals, we're stuck. Because, you know, again, examples, the museum, of the leak still needs to be fixed. So uh, that's the second option. And that's all determined by the cost of the project in MCA. Any questions on that? I realize we follow MCA, but we are in a small community, and it would be great to cater to the community a little more, you know. These are big price tags, and most of the people, most of the contractors deal with a lot smaller prices than this. And so, you know. I totally see what you're saying on that, and I think um, to, and I think that's probably been the biggest concern throughout this whole project, um, this whole situation. Um, talking with people, and, and not only that, just reading Montana code and I even talked with the county attorney that's a big price tag 75,000 is a lot of money um, but I, I truly believe the Commission has has come to a, a great meet in the middle and, and it, it comes it, it came with this Broward County project big bid book um, because I, I totally understand and see what you're saying is okay well if let's just use the sheriff's office for example they have a need it's underneath that threshold so all they have to do is come to us and say look this is what we need to accomplish we have it in our budget um, can we go ahead and move forward and here's here's the supporting documents and we say yes go ahead and do it um, it, it then is on the department head to go ahead and say okay um, this is what we're going to do, you know, this is who's going to do it. I think the best way to overcome that, and, I, and I've talked a lot with Mike, I've talked a lot with Corey over this, 
um, is building a, a helpmate to this bid book, and that is a, um, that's what I'm looking for, vendor list, thank you. Uh, and okay, so you as Mr. Amsk is a, uh, is a contractor, okay? What is it that you can do? You can do roofs, you can do this, you can do that, you can build, whatever. What is it you can do? So when the sheriff's office comes and says, hey, we want to do an inline grinder, we can go to the vendor list and say, okay, Mr. Amps is, is capable of doing this job. Um, Mr. Delger, I don't know all the local uh, contractors. And we as a commission, if we have that list, knowing that what you can accomplish can say, okay, yes, we agree with that. Have you contacted A, B, and C through our bid book? Um, I think that's a perfect way to meet in the middle on this issue. And in and, and, and some of your issues, I, you know, I think that's our biggest concern is the amount of money and what we're capable of doing through Montana Code. It's not that we're not following Montana Code, but I think that price tag is what scares a lot of people. And not having, so to speak, uh, enough checks and balances to, to sort of cater to, to our local uh, workers. I think if we were to make a help me for this this project bid book, I think that would overcome a lot of everyone's heartburns. Railroad County also has an online on your guys' website. Yes. And that could be printed off and put in this book. Yep. And put the new ones in on the website too. Sure. And, and I think that's where a lot of the heartache came. I know from the aspect of the, the, the roofing project, talking to so many people involved in that, uh, when it came down to finding a roofer, when they go to the yellow pages, there's no local roofer located in that section. And so um, if, if we would have had a vendor list, it would have been a lot easier to get those local bids. I, I went with Mike over the phone board and he showed me it and he did a professional job showing me what he did and how he went about it and I was very satisfied with that. Well, I appreciate that. And, and so, I tr and I don't mean to step on anyone's toes over speaking, but I truly believe if printing off, like you said, on the, on the website and building that vendor list, I think will overcome a lot of this. We'll open up transparency, I guess, would be the best way to, to explain that. And, and another piece of that is is the websites that we have two now. Uh, Towns and Area Chamber of Commerce has one, and BCDC has townsandmt.com. Um, neither one has one. Each has a general list of who is a contractor, but it doesn't list anything that you guys do. So if we could take that list that we're talking about for the bid book and actually put that onto both the websites, it'll not only be a list for us and our departments to use, but also anybody in the community yeah. looking for a roofer now has a place to go to get that same list. So, the money local and right, everybody right, has. exactly. Right. It's yeah, it, it's the goal we all share. Yeah. So I feel like now we have a solid road to be on to actually get that done. And, and honestly, I feel that in the beginning of all this, it was the transparency was the issue. And I truly, I truly believe that we're we're becoming more transparent. Um, and, I, and I, I appreciate your patience through this because <laughs> it's not that easy. So um, it's been a learning curve for sure. All right, so any questions, any further comments on that? No. All right. Um, the next, so that answered a couple of your questions from public meetings and from your, your list that you gave us. Um, one of the questions that you had is kind of a four-parter, and it is uh, letting the department heads be in charge of the bidding process to make final approval of the contracts. This could leave the county liable for a lawsuit, racism, discrimination, and it leaves the public in the dark. If the contract could go, would go sour, and the contractor was to sue, the department heads are not protected like the county commissioner is. Um, so first of all, the, the first question, letting the department heads be in charge of the bidding process, 
that is actually by design. We hire uh, professionals who know how to do bidding processes. We have a template for them to use. We have a county engineer that reviews bids or the county attorney that can review bids. Um, this is something that we actually put to our department heads because they are the professionals hired to do that. We don't necessarily have experience in that area. We're managers. So we manage them to be sure they're doing what's in their job description. Does that? Yeah. I, where I was going with that is, is <clears throat> like the department heads signing the contract to do the work. Um, oh, okay. it, it leaves everybody here in the dark, kind of. Um, <clears throat> in the Broadway County policy, it's against the policy to do that. So what? You, so what your um, con, what your concern is, if I'm if I'm get just so so we can get the right answer, is um, they come to us with a, a request. Uh, they show us that in their budget they can afford it uh, without going to PILT or this that or the other. In their budget they can afford this project. Um, they go through and find Joe Blow to do the job and then they sign off that they that's who they want to do it is that your concern yeah because there's no public comment or you know it's public interest and there's no comment on it because the contract signed out there it's not being signed here by you guys sure and in this policy it needs to come back here full view of everybody <clears throat> sure so they come to us they state their need, but what you would like is for them to come back to us and state, this is what I found and this is what the plan is. After. I, I would agree with that. Yeah, we can do that. Um, it is in full view, like I said, but this adds another step. We can certainly do that. And, and, yeah, I think and that would, could be during public yeah. comments so that it doesn't have to wait a week. Exactly. Uh, especially if it's an emergency like the yeah. leaking roof, you know, public comments, easily done. And yeah. I think if we do that moving forward, a lot of those questions is, okay, where did these bids come from, this, that, and the other, and why did you go that route? That, that could have been answered months ago instead of now, okay, it's done, why did they get the bid type thing. Yeah. So I appreciate that. All right, number two was, uh, this leaves the county liable for a lawsuit, racism or discrimination. Um, I actually, um, let's see, we do have, this is from our personal policies, and it's an anti-discrimination clause. So each of our uh, employees is trained, we had five trainings in the last 12 months on this. Um, five uh, training. So, we train very well on this. Our department heads, again, we hire professionals. Yeah. So they follow this. Any discrimination, I haven't seen any by any employee in this county in a very long time. Um, but they are, they are trained on that. Uh, see the other? Can, can I Yeah, ask? absolutely. Do you feel that if we were to add that step, that would answer or meet the concern that you have for that discrimination. Yep, that's okay. Following policy meets that whole the whole, whole thing. Whole thing. Okay, because our contractors, our our department heads are bonded. We learned that last week. It's in our, our minutes okay. from the insurance carrier, and again, um, it leaves the public in the dark. We're just adding another step, but we have had the transparency for the first step. It's just now we'll have a report back on the second step. So we'll add more to that. So you're good with that. All right. Like early on when you said the agenda of the you know, department head or whatever, you know, that's why the discrimination comes up. Oh, yeah. It's just there, like, say one guy don't want to work with this guy at all. Right. So he's not going to call and get, get a bid from him. So where does that leave, you know, that's kind of discriminating yeah. a little bit, so. No, and, and honestly, you know, Mr. Amscott, it's these rabbit trails that are taking our attention off of 
yeah. the, the important needs. And I, that's why I appreciate this time because I feel that we're coming off the rabbit trails and hitting back to the main trail. And your suggestion is a very good suggestion to build that transparency back up. Right, the next is uh, questions that came up in public comment a time or two. Um, and this goes back to uh, addressing that we hire our hiring process. I'm going to give you that too. Um, there you go, that's the hiring uh, procedure checklist. When we uh, have a vacancy, especially of a department head, what we do is we reanalyze the job description, see what is needed. Then we throw out as big a net as we can to get the most qualified people. There's nothing in law that says that it's only people in Broadwater County that we can hire. And so we do have some employees who do not live in Broadwater County, but they are by far the most qualified for a particular position. So it's, what we should be focused on is trying to bring those people into the community, encouraging them to move here because they love the community. But one thing we have to be aware of is we have a number of people who live in this county who work for Lewis and Clark County. So, Georgia. well, yeah. Lewis and Clark County, not the state even. Uh, so if, if there's a requirement that some citizens are putting on some of our employees that they have to live here, what does that do to our other citizens who happen to work for Lewis and Clark, Clark County or for the state in Lewis and Clark County? Should we be putting a fence around and say we're only going to work with folks who live here? Um, our maintenance department, uh, when I first started here, we had a salaried employee, one and a half, and they were paid for cleaning, emptying garbages, that kind of thing. And every single job for maintenance, upkeep of machinery, um, basic routine maintenance was contracted out at between $100 and $200 an hour. Today, we spend $400 a month contract for someone to come in and clean, and we have in-house at $25 an hour doing routine maintenance. The savings have been tremendous. The cost is about a quarter to an eighth difference um, per hour on having that in-house. So I want to make sure that we're all on the same page. We hired not a janitor when we hired a building supervisor, we hired a contractor, and we did that by design. Uh, we worked with MAKO uh, to make sure that what we had planned was legal, and uh, it's worked very well. This is just a pile of the trainings, of the emails um, that we have gotten that, that confirms that this was a good fiscal um, path for us to take. So I just want to make sure that that's out there. Okay. I had no questions on any of that stuff. So. That must have been someone else's stuff. Okay. Uh, yeah. All right. So <laughs> any questions on that? Uh, it's, it's actually, it's been brought up in public meetings. Okay. Um, it's been brought up in discussions. I know you've had a couple of those. Um, other folks have as well. So I guess it's a combination okay. of the two. May I ask one question? I'm going uh, right. to take public comment when we're done. Okay. All right, thanks. Um, so getting into the nitty gritty of it, the solid waste storage shed. Um, your question is why would you build a solid waste building in a floodplain and not having a permit? Uh, the permit question was answered on April 4th and uh, Mike Delger brought up the question and we, he was advised of what had happened. There was a contractor who was hired. He didn't get the permit, why? Because Broadwater County doesn't have building permits. This building was out of the city limits, the city does, um, so it was missed. As soon as the error was realized, he went and got the permit, and it's, it's been done, it's been corrected. So, error made, error corrected. Um, as far as the floodplain goes, we do have a Broadwater County floodplain administrator. He is aware um, of the building, of its location, and I also have on that subject an email from Brian and uh, he says, two years ago plus, when Dana moved the sheriff's impound yard, he placed two to two and a half feet of fill in the area where the impound yard and the shed had been built. 
when it rains, we no longer have a lake forming in that area like we used to. Um, so we have mitigated that and we'll continue to work with the floodplain administrator so that nothing comes up. My question was kind of going towards insurance. Uh, how the insurance would affect the building. You know, you, the storage you, you shed? put $100,000 of the equipment in here. And yeah, it's a floodplain. The uh, insurance follows the equipment, so it doesn't matter what, uh, you know, the, it being stored in a storage shed, it, it, storage shed costs under $20,000. Tobacco and the skid seer are far more expensive than that. Right, but you know, you put your equipment under storage to protect them from the elements. And that's, and that's what he's thinking. Yeah, main thing, you know, because insurance likes to get out of things. And because it's in the floodplain, they're not going to share it because of the fire or something else, but you answered my question. Well, actually, you can build buildings yeah. in floodplain, and this is actually flood hazard, which is different than floodplain. One is a 500-year event, the other is a 100-year event. But you can put buildings there. They are covered by insurance. Um, what you have the biggest trouble with is sewage, um, uh, drain fields, wells. It doesn't have any of that. It's not open to the public. It doesn't have any services. In fact, it will have a sign that says authorized personnel only. So we've, we've mitigated that, um, and it is covered by insurance. I, I did talk to Julie's department this morning, and she told me that MACO covers all county stuff in floodplains. Yeah. So. Yeah. And I think, again, going back to the transparency issue, I think if, if we could turn back time and have what we've discussed that we need to implement, it would have answered a lot of these, these questions. Um, it's just that transparency issue. And, 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 and if I can for a moment, I know a lot of people are here because they don't feel that the commission's being very transparent. Well, we're trying to overcome that. And, and it doesn't happen overnight. And, it, and obviously this has been a three week process to get to where we're at right now. But the fact of the matter is, is, is we're here. But I, I, I totally understand where you're coming with on, on that floodplain issue. If, if we would have had that extra step implemented, we could have answered that and, and people would have understood a little bit. And the elevation would have been drawn? Yep. Exactly. Not in the floodplain. Right. So yep. We might have put a bathroom or something like that. Exactly. Yep. And, and to that transparency thing also, it, it really is a two-way street because there has been question and answer and then question and answer and question and answer. The same questions asked, we saw it last week, same question asked three times, um, but in, there needs to be a two-way street. When a, when a question is answered, you go to the department head, you collectively, anybody, to actually accept that answer and, and not to keep going after the, the rabbit hole. Um, a couple of things that Brian said, who's the department head for solid waste, is nobody came to him to ask. Um, I still have yet to get a question asked of me for this project. Um, he also said on Monday, May 9th, when I had my regular meeting with you and Bill and Mike in the room, um, at the end of my time I asked, does anybody have any questions? And nobody asked any questions. Um, and then he also offered a tour. So I know you've talked to him since. Um, I talked to Brian this morning. But um, that would be the time. And, and also, uh, he has a vacancy on the Solid Waste Board. He'd be a great one for that Solid Waste oh, it's Board. Full. Is it? He just said it's full. It's been filled. Oh, darn it. Well, we can actually have him as an advisory member. Sorry, Brian. <laughs> I guess it shouldn't be my answer. Good, Brian. I'm glad. <laughs> Um, so I wanted to uh, let you know that this project, uh, some of the questions that Corey had said you had were, is it legal? What, who authorized it? And on who's dying? So uh, on September 14th, 2015, um, this project was authorized. So that may be another hole with the transparency question. Yes. Yeah, it was six months. It had been authorized. Sometimes things take time. Doesn't mean that it wasn't in full view of the public. It's just some pe folks had forgotten. I don't think you were attending meetings last fall, so you weren't here for that. But it is in the minutes, and here's a copy. Um, 
there were three commissioners present, myself, Commissioner uh, Salifka, and Commissioner Gravely. There was no opposition raised by any member of the commission, and there was no public opposition at the time, no, not even any questions. So um, we didn't know that it would become an issue. The simple bid proposal process was followed that we talked about earlier. Uh, there were two proposals because there just aren't that many contractors who do pole buildings. Um, three local contractors are used for this, for this project. Um, the financing, we also had reported to us on March 14th, so it was six months later, that the steel recycling alone had brought in revenue of $11,800. Well, the building is less than 20, easily two years of recycling revenue will pay for that building. So um, I think, is that, any further questions on that? I'm fine. I'm happy with that. All right. Any more questions from you guys? Or okay. comments? All right. We'll move on to the museum roof. Okay. Um, thank you for working with Mike and Linda on this. Um, I thought that was a good show of leadership. So, um, and I know that some of your questions are being posed by others, and you're kind of the, the spokesperson for that, Actually, which is fine. Actually, these were all my. Some of my them. Setup. We'll go a little bit beyond that, but these, the written ones are yours. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so your question was, if the insurance won't cover the roof, what happens if the museum was to burn down? I don't want the community to be in a total loss. Does the museum have their own policy? And yes. Um, this is just the cover sheet, but you can see the museum is right there. This is the county museum, or the county insurance. The museum building is actually a county building. It's managed and the responsibility falls on the museum board. But I talked to Julie and she said for the museum to have their own insurance to cover all the artifacts inside would be extremely expensive. That's why years ago, the county actually took over the building and covers it on our insurance as the owner. So we own that building. I don't know who built it in the beginning. So. Um, so the, okay, I just need some clarification. Yeah. So the county owns the building and the land, or? Yes. Okay. Yep. Um, and just like, you know, fire, flood, both are, are covered, both are important to make sure that we, we stay on top of. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, another question. Mike Meyer misled the commissioners that the county's insurance was going to cover the museum roof. Salifka and Obert voted to give assurance if the insurance didn't cover all the roof or some other problem arose and the county would cover it. Well, insurance fell through, so this could cost the county over $7,000. Um, a couple of issues on that. Mike didn't lead, mislead the commission, and I actually have a timeline that I'll show you that we weren't privy to until we put all the pieces together. Um, and yes, uh, if there is ever a shortfall uh, with a county project on a county building, we will pay that. We will never leave a bill unpaid. Um, as far as having a contractor putting them to work with the insurance, we won't do that either. It's our insurance, it's our insurance company, so the county will be that intermediary and work that out. Um, and what we have is actually a misunderstanding um, of sorts. The insurance company sent an email on March 11th, and what they said, there, um, this was sent to the museum. Um, they conferred with Dennis Jupka, who's the claims administrator, and he confirms there is no coverage for the roofing mistake. Excuse me, let me start at the bottom, at the back, because that's how you read emails. Oh, this is from January, that's when the, uh, let me give you a timeline. Where you can there you go. There's one for each of you. And okay, so the, um, the claim was submitted in January by the museum board because they're responsible for the building. <coughs> On March 2nd, this was about two weeks after we spoke with, with Mike, the purpose of, Dear County Commissioners, the purpose of this email is to inform you that we have concluded our investigation into the below captioned incident regarding the water leak at the Broadwater County Museum. In reviewing the photos, estimates, and written statements by John Stewart of J&J &J Roofing, 
It appears the original roof lacked adequate protection. As stated by Mr. Stewart, quote, I found there was no underlayment installed under the valleys, which was allowing for ice and water to back up under the valley flashings, unquote. Over time, water seeped under the shingles and found its way down the wall and into the museum. Unfortunately, in reviewing the Hartford policy, property policy for Broadwater County effective July 1, 2015 through July 30, 2016, this is not a covered cause of loss. However, the damage interior is covered. And that's something that the museum board and the insurance is currently working on. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Do we know who uh, did the roof before? that failed to do the, the proper? I, I don't know for sure. I've heard the name. I'd rather not say it publicly. Oh, no, that's fine. Um, I just, but I just, yeah, I think okay. they do know who it okay. was. And I know the museum has the records. OK. Yeah. Um, so then there's a Q&A back and forth, and then another um, message from Debbie Burke from the insurance company. She conferred with Dennis Jupka, the claims administrator, and he claimed, confirms there is no coverage for the roofing mistake. Errors and omissions coverage is on behalf of Broadwater County and not against third parties. The failure of the contractor to properly build a roof is also excluded in the Hartford policy, which states, quote, we will not pay for loss or damage caused directly or indirectly by any of the following. It includes workmanship. Uh, in regards to uh, subrogation, Mr. Jupka stated he would be willing to go against the contractor for the damages inside the museum. So that's again, museum board and the insurance company working on this. Um, but Mike didn't misled, mislead, because if you look at the timeline, the insurance was, uh, claim was in January. Mike came to see us in February, and what he said in that public meeting was, and this was February 22nd, part one on the YouTube video at 345. I'm working with the insurance company. About 60 seconds later, he says, so I'm working with the insurance company, not sure how much they'll cover, but they're saying they'll cover the whole thing because T-lock shingles are obsolete, can't even get them. So the insurance company would like to replace the whole thing. Um, so based on that, he was working with the insurance company. At that point, they hadn't concluded their investigation. So that was preliminary. The investigation was two weeks later. Um, so that's, that's where we're at on that. But you guys took a vote on it just because of the insurance. No, we didn't. We took a vote on it because, um, let's see, here's the same meeting. Probably should give assurance. You are good with that, Franklin. Both commissioners agree. Franklin, Franklin says, oh yeah, absolutely. Laura, assurance to move ahead as you need to with both roofs. So we didn't move ahead just because of the insurance. We moved ahead because there was a leak at the museum that had to be corrected. Because artifacts are in danger when there's a leak in the roof at a museum. It, the insurance is sidelined. If the insurance will pay it, great. If the insurance will pay part, great. That is not why we moved ahead. We moved ahead because there was a leak in the roof. Is that all right? Is that you disagree with what was done is what I'm seeing. Is that accurate? OK. Um, let's see. Let's just go to the um, overview. Um, the museum board asked for Mike's help. It's their responsibility. Mike is building supervisor and has construction experience. They have a good working relationship. And you asked the other day why we don't partner more. Here's a partnership. Um, that we should be very proud of. Um, so the, uh, the second part of your question then about the $7,000, that didn't apply to the museum roof, that was about the wood roof. Um, and we talked about that last yeah, week. All right. Um, and that, that other issue, that's just, uh, just so we, we walk away, it's just something that you're gonna agree to disagree, just so I, I need I need to know because I wasn't part of of that process. So I just just going from the, the problem was there was two roofs. One was insurance roof, one wasn't, and was voted on in the same vote. So they probably should have been separate votes for clarification. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, I just I want to I want to stay on level ground and not go through dips. I want to be able to. I'm happy with that. Okay. So just so that. Yeah. We can keep things separate for clarity. Sure. Yeah. Um, I do want to get back to the locals. I do have a letter from the museum board, and they did state they had attempted to contact three locals, one the year before, and they either hadn't gotten calls returned or the contractors were too busy. So um, this was read in a public meeting. I won't read it again, but there was a concerted effort made. Um, and that's where, if we would have that list, and all that vendor list, it would have been a lot easier to accomplish that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then the wick roof. Uh, this, your question was, this could cost the county over seven thousand dollars. Of course, that's we now know the wick roof that that referred to. Um, that is part of routine maintenance. It's what we pay our, our building supervisor for. It did come before the commission, uh, as did the wick roof we just talked about on February twenty second. There were two commissioners present at that time, myself and Commissioner Salivka. We both voiced support, um, and there was no public opposition. Um, in the future, we will separate the two so that it's clear. Um, and what was said in that discussion is um, uh, February 22, part one, at 434, Mike said, then the other issue is, so he did kind of break it through, but not clear enough, I understand. I talked about last, I talked about last down at the wood building. I'd like to fix it before there's a leak. He's talking about the roof. I have two bids already on it and they say it's end of life too and approximately the cost will be around $7,000. I ask, do you have the money in your building CIP? Mike responds, I have the money in my building CIP, yes. Franklin, probably should have been done before this. Mike, I've been told it's 25 years already. Franklin, yeah, I'm sure it's over 25 years on that building. Anyway, yeah, you better get on it. Uh, Laura, probably should give assurance. Are you good with that, Franklin? Both commissioners agree. Franklin says, oh yeah, absolutely. I said assurance to move ahead as you need to with both ropes. So it was done publicly, um, and I think you're right. We'll go ahead and, and divide those things out so that there's no confusion in the future. Uh, financing for that. We have a building CIP. We talked about yeah. that at length last meeting, um, and that's for routine maintenance. Yeah, I'm happy with and stuff, so I'm All right. Any questions from you guys or input on that? No. All Thank right. Um, the inline grinder, that was another one that came up uh, during public comment quite a bit. March 14th, the sheriff came to us and asked for uh, Commissioners Obert and Slifka gave Wynn permission to move ahead and purchase and install the inline grinder. He then went to Mike and they put together a package to work on it. They did come back and see us on April 4th. Um, there was some attempts to stall the project, but it is going underway because it's a savings of $30,000 for the county taxpayers for us to do that in-house. Um, we did get the permitting. I have emails from uh, the state and DEQ and the permit, the Plumbing Permit Bureau um, on that project. I have no questions on that really. Uh, okay. just that it's great that the city and the county is going to work together on it. And yeah. You know what? And it's not that I appreciate the fact that people had concerns, you know, to figure out if we were doing it properly. You know, and, and I think that's something that we really need to pay attention to just to make sure that things are being done uh, in, a, in, a, in a proper manner. Um, did it get frustrating? It, it, it did. But at least we know without a shadow of doubt that we crossed all of our T's and dotted all of our I's and that we're in compliance in every aspect of that project. I think the shadow was nobody sees what's down there. If you would go down there, if they would have brought a picture, everybody would be like, wow. It needs, yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, yeah. So I, I do. So the grind is very well needed? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And yesterday, or in 2005. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, so the last question then you had was on the building project. Um, you asked, the new buildings were contract before, now it's divided into five. You could have five different contractors. The county could benefit by having more bids from the contractors in their specialized area. 
I'm going to stop there and, and read Part B in just a minute. Um, I'm with you, 100% on that. This was done by design. It was Mike working with the county engineers uh, and architect to actually divide each of the projects individually uh, so that we can have a project manager, contract manager, uh, which will, we expect will save the county between $100,000 and $115,000 significant, but also will hopefully encourage locals to bid, bid on the individual pieces rather than an all-encompassing uh, general contractor bid. So that was actually done by design to try and encourage um, locals to bid on this. The bid that we have is, is one, uh, one advertisement. The project is all in one advertisement. It's just parts one, two, three, four, and five. So it's still one. So what you say, you're 100% right. Yeah, I'm not happy with that. As far as the conversion goes, it benefits the community. So. Yeah. Um, the other thing is, is uh, you said it sounds like a uh, division of contract, and you refer to 752305. Um, and what 752305 says is prohibit prohibition on division of contracts to circumvent bidding requirements. So we're not circumventing bidding requirements because it's all one. It's well over the $75,000 threshold. So it doesn't apply because we're not trying to circumvent anything because it's one project. Does that make sense? All right. Um, one thing with this uh, the project overview, um, it's been going on for four years. This is one of those partnerships that we talked about this week. Um, it's five different departments. Everybody's saving money because we're bringing it all together into one. We're looking at, we were last year, $47 a square foot, which is incredibly fiscally responsible. Um, and Wynn said we've had a million meetings on the project. He's actually not that far off. <laughs> Um, this is a good project and it's taken a lot of heat and I think because it's a good project. It really does fly in the face of those and it's not you Billy, but it's some of the others over the, the years that have spoke up or, or really tried to halt this or written you know, inaccurate um, articles to the paper, uh, letters to the editor, not articles. But those people who want to complain about government, this project flies in the face of that. So I think that's why it's being so heavily targeted. Um, but uh, I've, I've got some other stuff. If you are good with that and don't have any further questions, I won't go into it. Do you have any questions that we didn't ask? And do you guys have anything to offer that I didn't address thoroughly? Yeah, I'm happy with everything. Changes are being made that are, that are good for everybody. Oh, yeah, much needed. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and honestly, if, if, if this one came up, uh, the changes wouldn't have been made. So I do appreciate uh, you stepping forward and, and being a voice uh, to make the proper changes and working with the county attorney, working with us, meeting with us, uh, I, I shows a lot. So I think we're, we are, we're headed the right direction, now we just have to follow through. Um, and, and I think that's, that's the next step, is just showing the follow through. And it's hard to do it with one on one, but you guys have to make a decision all in one, you know, so you have to have a meeting. So, it's, right, I, I would rather do it the other way, but just, that's just it. Yeah, it's just yeah, I, I did everything Nick said. Um, you know, oftentimes you don't know what the public is missing until somebody comes forward and says, Hey, I'm missing this. So, I really appreciate you coming forward as well and our talks uh, one on one. Um, we will be doing better. Um, I'm, I'm not sure we were necessarily broken, but it wasn't transparent enough. And now we're going to do better and be even more transparent. And I expect in another five or six years, we'll have the same discussion with someone else and we'll even make more improvements at that time. So thank you very much. I appreciate thank you wanting to be a part of the solution. Thank you so much, Billy. Really. Appreciate it. Thanks, Billy. All right, does anybody else have any questions on that subject? Larry? Just one, Madam Chair. Um, we touched on hiring policy for the county employees. And, and the only question I'd like to add, or ask is uh, <clears throat> when minimal requirements for education and experience is, is posted, 
Um, and they're not met by all the applicants. Are we reposting that or are we just hiring out of the, the applications that's already on the file? Is that an option or is that covered by MCA? Our <coughs> HR consultant has advised us that our applications shouldn't say minimum requirements are required. Instead, minimum requirements are preferred. Sometimes you can have somebody who uh, doesn't necessarily have a bachelor's degree, but they learned far more in the School of Hard Knocks. And so you don't necessarily want to kick somebody out because they don't have a minimum requirement. So per her guidance, our, our advertisements now say preferred. So we can actually include that uh, person who may not have that minimum requirement. Does that, make, does that answer your question? Well, it does, uh, okay. to the point where I was wondering if it was policy that, uh, that uh, well, it does. I see where it protects the, the county in that sense. Um, I just know that, you know, on occasion that, that it arose where there's a, a rather large uh, discrepancy in that, maybe education or whatever, that, that if it's policy just to, just to review the applications that you have, you, you don't repost it with, with lowered standards, I guess, is what I'm right. asking. Right. right, and if we don't meet a, a certain, you know, if we don't have somebody who really shines uh, for a particular position, we can repost, but we'll repost the same way. Yes? I guess with the promotions inside the jail, um, for a sergeant position, it says in our policy, you must have two years of experience or one year of experience as, as corporal. Um, and it says you must. If, and if I have a pool of candidates for that or applicants, are you saying if, if I feel somebody is more qualified, maybe they've been here eight years, but they haven't been corporal for one, can I hire that or promote that person over a person that's been corporal? Thanks for the clarification. So, yeah. yes. um, and I, I should have said this too to Larry's question. Some positions require a certain degree. Sanitarian, I think you have to have a certain degree. Uh, county attorney, you have to be a lawyer. Um, <laughs> uh, with you guys, I think we would have to defer to the collective bargaining agreement first and what that says, and then we would defer to your uh, statutes. And I don't know, you guys have a whole different set of requirements, um, so we would have to look at that individually and probably work very closely with Michelle on that. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Yep. Any other questions? Corey. I just have one question on the, <clears throat> do, what do we have a current policy on what's the contracting authority that the department can do before they have to come to the commission? Is there a number or a scope? Because, for example, I just bought some software for our computers that I had money in my budget, so I didn't come ask you before I did that. It's just technically a contract, so uh, where's that level? Do we have a level, and if not, should we consider it as establishing a level, even if it's something that's in someone's budget authority or budget room? I think we need to work on that. Yeah. Um, Mike Delter had mentioned uh, two weeks ago, I think, uh, during public comment that the fire district has a $600 level. If you want to spend more than that, you have to go to the trustees. Well, if we did that here, we, would, we wouldn't do anything but meetings. I mean, we'd be here 24-7. Um, if, if it's in the budget, uh, then there should be that leeway, but if there should be a certain amount, I mean. I think it would be reasonable and prudent. I mean, yeah. I mean, obviously, you need certain things, whether it's an operating system or this, that, and the other. Um, I'm just trying to think of what has been done in the past. Um, I don't think that's something we can answer yet yeah. because your equipment to do your job is a computer program. Um, Brian's, I think he left, but his is a skid steer uh, or a building right. to protect his skid steer. Sometimes they're not that far off in cost. So I think we need to actually uh, <coughs> put some work into that. We've, yeah. we've had people come forward. Um, in the past, but it's not reasonable for everything. So I don't know. Yeah. And I just recommend we define it. It may not be a number, it may be a, a project. Yeah. Um, you know, if you're building something, if you're 
it's capital purchase of a certain amount or something. I don't know. I don't yeah, there's so many variables. Yeah. Maybe particular object quotes okay. um, need to come before the public. And I think that just helps with the transparency. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we need to at least get something in in order so we don't run into this problem again. So I appreciate that. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. We are at 1120. We'll move on to our next agenda item. Thanks, Billy. Uh, we have, we're a little bit late, Ken Shepard requests for forgiveness of penalty and interest on mobile home taxes. Is Ken here? I'm here. Oh, good. Thank you, Madam Chairman and members of the board. I appreciate you taking the time to let me come up and talk to you about this. Absolutely. Thanks for coming. Yeah. I brought you copies of the uh, aforementioned information here, even in color. And uh, we got one for you too. And he's he's uh, getting some background, so if you give us just a second. Oh, no problem. No problem. Thank you.
Answer the question, Commissioner. I don't have the answer. Okay, that's all right. <laughs> thank you. All right, we will give you the floor. All right, thank you. Um, we have two lots there. There's a lot the house is on, and then there's a lot that there's a mobile home on. And we financed it with Chase, and Chase was paying all the taxes, we thought. So one day I'm looking and you know when you get your taxes, if you know your house payment, it's, it's in your house payment, you, you don't worry about it and you just file them. But one day I'm looking and, and I start digging into it. How come I owe so much in taxes? And I realized they hadn't been paying this all this time, for this whole period of time. And <clears throat> so I looked at it and I said, how in the world am I going to pay that? And when I called in, somebody said, well, take it up with you guys, so I'm here. Um, the penalty total for the whole period here is 67.44 and the interest is eleven hundred and one dollars and sixty two cents eleven oh one point six two that's if I if I if you guys agree to this then I still owe almost fourteen hundred dollars well thirteen thirty two ten is what I owe thirteen thirty two ten and I, I can pay that I, the other I'd have to make some payments um, I'd appreciate some help on this I would love to help because I can pay it off today. It should help me out. What, what is the amount you said you could pay? I could pay the uh, 1332.10, which would put it all up and we'd be all paid. I brought a check along to do that. Okay. But if I have to pay the other, I would have to make payments or something. Sure. But we, we've paid our tax. If you look, our taxes are all paid on all my other property. And um, um, currently, the lady that lives in the house only charges 400 bucks to live there. And, um, and right now, there's a single mother couldn't find a place to live, so we're letting her live in our house, and we're living in a house in Bozeman right now. And we're going to retire in that house, so when we, when she leaves, <laughs> if we can get her out of there. <laughs> but, uh, we love it. It's just so nice out there, quiet, and, and Townsend's wonderful time. They have great Saturday garage sales, too. <laughs> anyway, I'd appreciate your help if you could. <clears throat> This goes back about six years in. Yes, sir. Back to ten. Yes. Yeah, it shocked me when I saw that. You know, it isn't bad when you make your payments on time, but when you don't know you're supposed to make them. But the house, the house, the house is paid for, and the taxes on the land under the trailer have been paid. That was in the finance agreement with the bank, but they never included the trailer, and we didn't know that. Sure. Weren't you getting statements showing that you absolutely yes that you were delinquent on this? No, I, what I got. Well, I don't have it with me what I've got, but I got this one. And I have a secretary who pays all my bills. She pays all my taxes on everything. I have rentals in Bozeman, 37 rentals. And so she takes care of it all. And one day I, you know, guys got to look at his fares once in a while. If you're not paying attention, people, even though they work for you, you know how you got and they didn't do it the way you wanted. She didn't pay it. One day I couldn't, and I didn't yell at her. I didn't, you know, be mean to her, but I'm here today because this was not paid. I guarantee if you look at all my other taxes, they're paid. I didn't do this on purpose. This is, you know, just it happened. I can give you the totals at the bottom of the lines if you need them. That would really help. 
all. The penalty yes. is a total of 67.44. And the interest is 1101.62. Okay. And if you, you know, I don't have any problem with paying the penalty. I even came prepared to go with the penalty if I had that. I'd pay 1399.54 with the penalty. 1332.10 without the penalty, just getting out of the interest. Sure. And uh, for whatever it's worth. You don't have the total for the uh, tax amount, do you? The total tax part? Yeah. It's 2501.15. Well, that, but that would be, um, let's see, if I got out of just, uh, just paying the tax is 1399.54. The tax is 1399.54. That's what that column would be total up. That's 2501.16 minus the interest and penalty would be these two factors I gave you. So 1399 1399.54, that means if I paid you 1399.54, that would be the tax and the penalty. If it's the tax only, it's 1332.10. That's tax only. No penalty, no interest. The interest is what's really killing it because that's that's a lot, quite a bit. It's just a trailer house, you know. That must be worth quite a bit, I guess. It's a 1980 Gallatin, so it's... 26 years old. So the interest is more or less your concern. Yeah, the interest, a penalty, I deserve to pay that, I guess, but I think if I could get out of the interest, I could pay the whole thing to pay. And how much is the interest total? 1101.62. It's almost as much as the tax. And the penalty is? Uh... The penalty is only 67.44. sure this is current because we just took this off this morning but when I go up and pay it if it's a few dollars this way or that it'll all be paid sure and I think that includes the total for 16 so I maybe even paying ahead in that figure so leave it down because that can make the difference between what I did because I did not include oh okay 16. that would help some too because then I can pay that and then catch another one in six months mm -hmm. so what you're saying is you were giving uh, you had the house and the trailer, and you thought that the mortgage house and the land we always paid, and the trailer was to me it didn't catch it. My secretary takes these and puts them in a file, and she said, "Well, that's on your, that's you know, in your finances, and when you pay that." We even checked two or three years ago and asked them if they're paying the taxes, and yeah, they were. And, and I've never thought another thing about it until I was looking through things and caught this. I guess you got to check things over yourself once in a while. You've, this gal's worked for me for 19 years, so she's pretty, does a good job. Sure, but everybody makes mistakes. Right, and I, in my own ways, I've done mistakes too. Sure. And could you um, discuss a little bit your recollection of uh, trailers and the taxing and the county's collection on those taxes? And, and I don't work a lot with this commissioner, so bear with me. But I believe in this case, if Mr. Shepard is willing to pay the taxes and the penalty, if he's willing to throw that one in, I would suggest in this, in this particular case, because of the circumstances, I would recommend forgiving the interest in getting that amount of money in. Um, there are... Mm, several people out there with mobile homes who 
are not as responsible as Mr. Shepherd in coming out with money. So I can I, I him for that. Sure. Can I ask some clarification? Mm -hmm. uh, in the past, uh, we.